That's right, my brother. I was on the Today Show. My first book had been out less than a week. My publisher calls me up and it says, Hot Shot, you're going to be interviewed on the Today Show. Fly me up to New York, one Rockefeller Plaza up on the 30th floor, Today Show Studios. And I'm watching guests file out one by one of them being interviewed. Well, they put me in this room, an hour and a half goes by, and the executive producer comes in and says, Dennis, you're going to be interviewed next. Well, I get up out of my seat, I go in this room, I look in the mirror, I want to make sure that my jacket is straight, my tie is straight, my hair is combed. I want to put my best foot forward in front of all the viewers. While I'm in this room, a woman comes in, and she says, you're the guy who wrote that book, aren't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, how long did it take you? I said, it took me seven years. She said, man, you got to be proud. I said, I really am. She said, who's going to interview you this morning? I said, well, it might be Brian Gumbel, Katie Cork, Mark, or Larson. It'll be one of them. And then she said, I understand that 10 million people watch the Today Show every morning. I said, 10 million folks? <laughs> she said, tell me the truth. Are you nervous? I said, what, me, nervous? What would make you think that? She says, because you're in the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, thank you very much. Won't be nervous today. Clifton, thank you, my brother. You are empowerment. Oh, my goodness. Only two things you got to do, sports fans, to be empowered. Number one, when given a task or assignment, always complete it to the best of your ability. And number two, always go the extra mile. But you're adding a different touch and a different flavor on it because, my brother, you're making a difference. See, there's only four things in life you want to do. Number one, you want to make a difference. Number two, you want to make a difference with others who are making a difference. Number three, you want to make a difference with others making a difference, doing something that makes a difference. But number four, you want to make a difference with others making a difference, doing something that makes a difference at a time when it makes all the difference in the world. Boys and girls, not getting political, don't do it, uh-uh. But yes, this is the time when it makes all the difference in the world. Can you uh, put my slides up there, my brother? I got to read you a passage taken out of one of my books. And this is a book that I wrote years ago, my fourth book. Went around the country, and I dared to ask 1,000 black grandmothers, and I got to focus on any demographic, but that was the segment nearest and dearest to me at the time. I asked 1,000 black grandmothers, if you could write one letter to your children or to the next generation, what would you tell them about life? And don't you know, Dallas, I received letters from every type of black grandmother under the sun. Doctors and lawyers, women dropped out of school in third, fourth grade. Women with PhDs from Harvard, Stanford, and Duke to those barely a seventh grade education. Women whose children and grandchildren are thriving and surviving to one kind soul. Her name was Flora Kelly. She lives in Waterloo, Iowa. Miss Porter, and I'll introduce my students shortly. Flora Kelly, she has seven children. And the day in which she wrote my letter, Five were incarcerated in prison. Yes. Mm. Well, in the words of Flavor Flav, to get this party started right, <laughs> I received this letter January 4th, 1999. And this grandmother lives in Hampton, Virginia, and she went so far to even entitle her letter. She says, where there's hope, there's life. Who's the most dangerous individual in the room? Most dangerous individual in the room is any man or woman without hope. Who is the most pitiful individual in the room? Man and woman with sight, but no vision. At some point in life, and here's the letter, at some point in life you'll be faced with a crisis that seems so overwhelming, it will shake you to the core. A loved one dies, a marriage crumbles, disease strikes, a child goes astray, life savings are squandered, but this I know, Dallas. Into each, rain, each life, a little rain is going to fall. In June 1992, I was diagnosed with cancer. Following surgery, I faced months of chemotherapy. Each treatment lasted me, you know, four hours and left me so weak, I needed assistance just to function. I lost my appetite as well as weight, and my hair, well, that came out in clumps. Being bald was the least of my worries. I had to learn to inject myself as part of the treatment to keep my white blood cell count up. To be honest, Dallas, Texas, I didn't think I was going to make it. I had nearly 
given up hope. But my Lord spoke to me as he so often does at my hour of need, and I said, you know, this is not the end. What can cancer do? Cancer could not call my outlook. Cancer could not steal my faith. Cancer could not destroy my peace. Cancer can rot not erase my memories. Can and not, cannot invade my spirit, and it will not shatter my hope. Where there's hope, there's life, and I choose to live. I thank God to be able to wake up each morning and move on to my own power. But if I didn't, I'm confident I can handle it. There's still hope. If not for me, then for someone else. I would instruct my doctors to give my eyes to the little boy who cannot see, to give my ears to the little girl who cannot hear, to give my heart to the woman who knows nothing but pain, and to give my kidneys to the child chained to dialysis. Regardless of your circumstances, you have so much to hope for. Well, I bring you greetings from my school, Clark Atlanta University School of Business. Living proof, I never miss class, why? I had three classes this morning, not the last one ran to catch a flight. Thank you very much, Clifton. I, am, uh, I love you too, my brother. And here I am at SMU. You're looking at one of my classes back there, and I don't know which class that is, but I gotta introduce you to students who have seen me in action, and I love them dearly. I have no problem telling my students that I love them. You see, love is the master plan. And you gotta be careful when you're talking about love. Why? Business folks freak out when you talk about love. <laughs> but I had a student come in my, come in my office, Dr. Kimbrough, uh, come over in the classroom. I wanna show you a couple businesses that I'm about to run. And he goes up to the smart board and he says, I'm going to start an LLC and then I'm going to go ahead and take the profits for that and I'm going to go ahead and pour it in this one. And in about five years, Dr. Kimbrough, I'm going to be bank like Hank. And I said, my brother, my brother, pump the brakes, pump the brakes. <laughs> I said, money is not the bottom line. Dr. Kimbrough, you of all people. No, money is not the bottom line. Love is the bottom line. You love your job? Guess what? You get in the parking space closest to the building. You love your coworkers, and you're going to make manager in no time. Uh, you're an entrepreneur and you love your customers, guess what? You're getting more customers. And you doubt me, all you got to do, I had a presentation at the Gallup organization. Go read Don Clifton. Go read Marcus Buckingham. They collaborated on a book called The 12 Elements of Effective Managing. You need to go get that book. I've had a couple of presentations at the Gallup organization, number one in the world in leadership. Disney is number two. Presentations of both of them. The 12 elements of effective managing. And of the 12, three to four got nothing to do with money, got nothing to do with managing, but got everything to do with love. What's the first element of effective management according to the Gallup organization? My boss cares for me as a person. Oh, wow. My boss cares for me as a person. Number two, my boss gives me the resources that I need to do my job effectively. What's number three? I got a best friend at work. <laughs> Whoa. And then number 13, which is the hidden silent element, what's number 13? I know the name of the individual who cleans my office at night. Tony Frazier. Tony Frazier cleans my office at night. Tony Frazier is a grandmother. And not just any grandmother. She had one of her grandsons killed in a drive-by shooting. She's taking care of her two grandchildren. And you can always tell when Tony Frazier cleans my office. Why? She always hits my desk with a little pledge. Got two students, I'll introduce them, and they know no one on campus got more students than me, so I get papers all over the place. When Tony Frazier cleans my office, my papers are in a nice stack. She even cleans the monitor to my computer even cleans the keyboard. Love is the bottom line. We got Daniel Porter right here from Iowa. Come on, stand up, DP. Give Daniel Porter some love. <laughs> now, Daniel, what was your concentration? My concentration was marketing. Wow. Yes. You're going to come down here on the blue X and give you 10 seconds of hell? No, I'm not going to do that to you. I'm not <laughs> going to do that to you. And Jasmine, keep saying it, Danielle. And Jasmine, Jasmine Eek Walker, all the way from El Paso, Texas. And I know you're a county. Wow, thank you very much. Now, what do they have in common? Just like every student who has taken my class, and I don't know what year that is, but everybody on that campus knows my classroom. 
Why? Because I got a sign on my door. And they read the sign. And what does the sign say? If you don't want to work hard, you don't belong here. And if you don't want to lead, under no circumstances, walk through my door. Then if you got the guts, you got the power, you got the temerity to walk into my classroom, there's another sign. Take five steps and turn to your right. They've seen the signs. And what does that sign say? It says, mediocrity is not the standard in this class. Now, you can be mediocre someplace else, but damn it, you can't be mediocre here. <laughs> you can't be. Now, who in the world taught me that? I interviewed her twice, Rachel Robinson, Jackie Robinson's widow. I said, Miss Robinson, what was it like being married to the man who broke the color barrier in baseball? She said, well, Jack only lived by one rule. And I said, what is that? She said, excellence is the norm, not the exception. Excellence is the norm, not the exception. Now, you came here and you told me that you were empowered. When you are the best at what you do, it's game over. You never have to worry about income, and you never have to worry about employment. Why? The marketplace will seek you out. The marketplace will seek you out. And we're going to talk about it. I'm so glad that you highlighted your values, your seven core values. I'm going to give you three key components today, and one of them is about values. And what do we know about values? Don't you ever compromise your values. Don't you ever compromise your values. As a matter of fact, you are in life right now by the values that you have set. So we know all about leadership, driven, the work is a calling, blah, blah, blah. What do we know about leaders? Leaders make things happen, all right? Years ago when I taught entrepreneurship, everybody wants to teach at the MBA level. Man, I want to teach at them. Why is it important you teach at the MBA level? Because you don't hear an excuse of the dog gave my homework. Uh, my computer broke down. Um, gee, uh, man, I didn't know we had class today. I thought somebody said they canceled, you know. <laughs> well, it's been a number of years since I've been at the MBA level, all right? But when I was, several years ago, I always taught entrepreneurship. That is my class. That's what I'm known for. And I always use the Bill Gates case. I always use the Bill Gates case. And what do you know about Bill Gates? Well, it depends. You go ahead and read the Harvard business case. And what does Harvard say? Spring semester is freshman year. Bill Gates drops out of Harvard. Why? Because in between classes, he and his best friend, Paul Allen, go to a bookstore. And they gravitate over to the magazine section, and they stumble upon a magazine that's throwing out a challenge for anybody who can come up with an operating system that would allow two computers to talk. Now, I might be the oldest individual in this room. I am walking distance. In the next month, I will be 67 years old. And I remember when you had 50 million different PC manufacturers in the early 1980s, and none of them could share data. Why? They didn't have an operating system, 50 million different operating systems. So they stumble up upon this magazine, throwing out this challenge, and what does Bill Gates do? He goes to the desert, New Mexico, for the next seven years of his life, takes a team of seven with him. Fast forward the videotape seven years, he comes out with his Windows program that would finally allow computers to trade information. And what does he do? The first thing he does, he picks up the phone and he calls the president of Encyclopedia Britannica. He said, sir, you don't know me, but me and my team have been out here and we finally came up with an operating system that will allow two computers to talk. And if you get on our desktop, I know you never heard the word before, New jargon, new lexicon in the industry. If you get on our desktop, you can sell all the Encyclopedia Britannica's you want for $10 a pop. And what is the CEO of Encyclopedia Britannica, what does he say? What is his retort? What is his reply? He says, young man, are you out of your mind? $10 a pop? We sell a set, 24 books in our set for more than $1,000. I suggest that you call somebody else. Click and hangs up on Bill Gates. True story. A few minutes goes by, Bill Gates dusts off his low self-esteem, and he summons up the courage to make a second phone call. And this time he called the president of Encarta. And don't you know, before the game was over, Encyclopedia Britannica couldn't even give their books away. Now, Dr. Kimbrough, what in the world does that have to do with you? Sometimes it's risky not to take a risk. Sometimes it's risky not to take a risk. What does that have to do with wealth? The average individual in our society gets four ideas a year, any one of which, if you had the guts, if you had the fortitude, if you had the courage, if you had the temerity to blast forward and move out, would make you financially independent. But what do we do? 
we dismiss it. Now, we got folks here in the corporate sector, uh, sector, in the social sector. I know you got 50 million ideas in the back of your mind right now that would make your job more efficient and more effective. That would put you on the cutting edge. That would place you and your company on the firing line. Well, what in the world is stopping you from doing it? What in the world is stopping you from doing it? Heart of that is grit. Don't you know you can take a class at Harvard called grit? They got a class at Harvard Business School called grit. And what is grit? Grit is persistence. And what is persistence? Persistence is believing in yourself when no one else will. And what is the soul of persistence? What do we even know about success? Success is a statistical event. I tell my students, and my colleagues hate for me to talk like this, but I got to tell my students the truth. Why am I Dr. Kimbrough? Am I Dr. Kimbrough because I'm smarter than you? Hell no, I'm Dr. Kimbrough because I got more college hours than you have. You get the same number of college hours I have and you'll be Dr. Whoever. Success is a statistical event. That's all it is. Now these are three individuals that I interviewed for my fifth book. And they really capture, encapsulate what we call grit. There's Bob Johnson, got a chance to interview him twice. And what do you know about Bob Johnson? Yeah, he's the founder of BET, but don't you know that twice a month for almost two years, no matter where he was, he caught a flight, flew to Chicago, rented a car in Chicago, drove to Oak Brook, Illinois, and sat in the lobby of McDonald's corporate headquarters waiting for anybody to come out of the marketing department or advertising. Why? Because he knew BET wouldn't be on the air if he didn't have a major sponsor. Two years. Uh, baby girl, that's grit. Who was the woman in the middle? Michelle Hoskins, Hoskins Sip. Anybody from Chicago? You know about her? She got that recipe was passed down generation to generation and no one did anything with it. She says, this is my epiphany. This is my high watermark. I'm following through with this. And what did she do every Monday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning for two straight years? She called Denny's. She knew that she business would go under if she didn't have a major account. And what occurred? She became Walmart, one of Walmart's first minority suppliers. And who are you looking at on the left? That's Greg Barranco. His wife is a trustee at Clark Atlanta University. But Greg Barranco, here is a young man, got his degree in business administration from Southern University. One dream, one vision. Remember I said the most dangerous individuals without a hope. One dream, one vision. What do you want to do? He wants to sell cars. That's all he ever wanted to do. But big problem. The number one car dealership in Baton Rouge was Audubon Ford. And we are going back to the 80s. What happened in the 1970s at Audubon Ford? Blacks weren't even allowed in the showroom. You had African Americans buying cars at Audubon Ford, and they had to do the deal out on the parking lot. Five seconds after Greg Barranco gets his degree from Southern University in Business Administration, he goes right to Audubon Ford, stands out there in the parking lot waiting for the sales manager to come. Sales manager comes, Barranco hands him a resume, extends his hand and says, my name is Greg Barranco and I'm here to help you sell cars. He takes one look at this brother and he says, I'm sorry, uh, we don't have any openings. Greg Barranco says, fine. 24 hours later, goes back to the same dealership, stands right there in the parking lot, sales manager comes out, hands him a resume, extends his hand, hi, my name is Greg Barranco and I'm here to help you sell cars. Didn't I see you yesterday? Yeah. What did I tell you yesterday? Uh, that you didn't have any openings. Well, I just thought something might have changed overnight and I didn't want to miss out. <laughs> Look, damn it, he did that for 30 straight days. 30 straight days until they finally gave up and gave in. That record that Greg Barranco set at Audubon Ford still stands today. Most cars sold in a 30-day period. So what can we learn from these case studies? <laughs> People don't care about you until they know how much you care about them. And what is grit? Like I said, grit is believing in yourself. Here we go right here. Now you talk about grit and you talk about people believing in you. Well, you know, the second key point is about your values. Like I said, Peter, thank you very much. Never compromise your values. And what do you know about Martin Luther King? Well, I love that quote. 
I tell all my millennials all the time who are addicted to that cell phone, your day, your life is officially over the day you begin to talk about, think about, and discuss everything that doesn't matter. But what do we know about Martin Luther King? Well, number one, his name wasn't Martin, his name was Michael. When he was eight years old, his father had his name legally changed to honor the German theologian. Number two, just like T.D. Jakes, just like Tyler Perry, just like Christian Laboutin, Martin Luther King's high school dropout. Martin Luther King didn't finish high school. You do the calculus. Skip the ninth grade, skip the 11th grade, enter, uh, entered Morehouse at age 15. What else do you know about Dr. King? Um, you know, never earned more than $10,000 over the course of any year over the course of his life. Now, I'm a hotshot know it all business students. Dr. King, bro. But he did win the Nobel Prize, and with that came a cash windfall of excess of $150,000. Yes, 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 yes. But he gave every dime of it back to the movement except $10,000. He had to borrow 10 grand from his father-in-law to pay his income taxes. Got up at the same hour a day every day. Got up at 6.15 in the morning, ate the same breakfast, coffee and orange juice, 6.30 in the morning to 7.30 in the morning. That was the golden hour. That was an hour for P&D, prayer and devotion. He had a book line study. There were 200 books in that study. Every hour of the day, right off the bat, 6.30 to 7.30, prayer and devotion. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther King lived in the moment. What moment are you talking about? Well, he started his day off with prayer and devotion, and before that head hit the pillow at night, prayer and devotion, he lived life between two prayers. 1963, Martin Luther King gave more than 300 speeches, traveled more than 300,000 miles to give those 300 speeches. And he always flew first class. Did you know that? Martin Luther King always flew first class. Not because he had a huge ego, not because he was narcissistic, not because he was conceited. The reason why Martin Luther King flew first class, when he got to the airport and he got to the terminal and he got to the gate and the other passengers saw was going to be on the plane with him, no one wanted to sit next to him. So the pilot and flight attendants would get together, um, where can we put this mm, where he won't be a nuisance to anybody? I throw it up in first class. Now, first assignment that I give in my class to my students, before I even distribute my syllabus, I tell them, pull out a sheet of paper and get a pencil, and I want you to write the number 30 on that sheet of paper. And I want you to look at that number 30 day in and day out. And I especially want you to look at it when you flunk my final and you don't think life is going to go on. <laughs> and I definitely want you to look at that number 30 when you don't know where you're going to get the financial resources to come back in the spring or come back in the fall. And look at the number 30 when you say you can't take CAU any longer, you and your roommate bumping heads, folks back home acting a fool wanting you to come home. Damn it, look at the number 30. When you're between a rock and a hard place, please, Please meditate on that number 30. Now, what in the world does that have to do with you? Over the course of his adult life, Martin Luther King averaged 30 racial prank-filled phone calls a day. There was no call or I, caller ID. There was no inscription on the cell, no cell phone. No, but he, didn't know, he didn't know. Phone ring, nigga, I'm going to click. <laughs> phone ring, nigga, don't start your car, click. Phone ring, now I know, nigga, I know you kids, kids go to school, click. And you can't be more. And you can't have more. And you can't do more. And what in the world has that got to do with Steve Jobs? Because as I say in The Wealth Choice, Martin Luther King and Steve Jobs used the same marketing strategy to reach their goals and objectives. Did you know that? And what is that marketing strategy that they used? Number one, tell me where we are. Tell me, that, don't embellish. Give me the 411, give me the real deal. Tell me where we are. Number two, tell me where we can be. Tell me where we can be. And number three, make it that way. Make it that way. All right, Martin Luther King, tell me where we are. This country wrote a check to the black man that came back marked insufficient funds. Steve Jobs, tell me where we are. Well, if you're like me, you got a cell phone, you got a Palm Pilot, you got a pager, you got an MP3 player, you got 50 million different electronic gadgets. Okay, tell me where we are. Number two, tell me where we can be. Dr. King, tell me where we can be. 
Yeah, you wrote a check and it came back marked insufficient funds, but I had a dream that my four children would be gauged by their character rather than the color of the skin. Okay, Steve Jobs, we got 50 million ga different gadgets, but tell me where we can be. Well, I called on my systems engineers and I called my graphic designers and I called you know, my, my team together and brought them in my office and I said, wouldn't it be great? We all got 50 million different gadgets if we could go ahead and place all these gadgets on one particular device. All right, tell me where we are, tell me where we can be. Now, damn it, make it that way. Dr. King, I had a dream free at last, free at last, thank God almighty. Free at last. Steve Jobs, make it that way. Ladies and gentlemen, April 7th, 2009, introducing the iPhone. Martin Luther King got 250,000 people on an August, 20, August 28th, 1963, sweltering summer day to come to Washington, D.C. And one-fourth were white. They didn't go to Washington, D.C. because Dr. King asked them to. They went to Washington, D.C. because they wanted to be there. Steve Jobs got millions of folks to stand in line 3 o'clock in the morning in the pouring rain in the middle of the winter outside an AT&T store. Why? Because he wanted them to? No, they wanted to do it. Why? They wanted to be the first in the office. Look what I got. So what can you learn from those case studies? People don't care about you until they realize how much you care about them. Don't you ever compromise your values. Speaking of which, Harry Belafonte, Colin Kaepernick, what does Harry Belafonte say? Harry Belafonte says the average entertainer, the average celebrity, the average athlete out here in L.A., first thing they do when they get up in the morning, they call their accountant and see how much money they make. Harry Belafonte says, when I get up in the morning, the first person I call was Nelson Mandela. Who's going to live a more fulfilling life? Who's going to live a more fulfilling life? Folks ask me all the time, Dr. Kimbrough, of all the people that you interviewed, who had the greatest effect on your life? Well, as we wrap this puppy up, doesn't take long to get your message across. Last time I was here, I don't know if anybody's paying attention. Let people waste your money, but don't let anybody waste your time. Don't let anybody waste your time, not an individual seated in here today. If I gave you one hour to find out how much money that you have in your possession, you could call your banker, you can call your accountant, you can call your grandma, you can call your auntie, you can go home, and if you're like my mama, look between the pages of your Bible. And you can come back in an hour, and you can tell me how much money is in your possession. But there's not an individual seated in here today who can tell me how much time you have. And baby girl, if you're like me, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. So Dr. Kimber, what in the world is saying? I'm saying let people waste your money. But don't let anybody waste your time. If you live the normal life, and what is a normal life? Do the calculus. 74, 77 years on Earth? What in the world does that equate to? 30,000 days on Earth. That's all you get. 30,000 days on Earth. So let me wrap this bad boy up. Time is not running out, but your life is. Sooner or later, you got to cut on Shark Tank and you got to ask the entrepreneurial question. What is the entrepreneurial question? Uh, what am I going to do with the rest of the time that I have left? What are you going to do? Well, hopefully, this case study will go ahead and clarify that for you. Who are you looking at? You're looking at Osceola McCarty. Now, to go ahead and blow the dust off of this, Osceola McCarty was a little washerwoman. Little washerwoman, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Spent a day with her. I spent a day with her in her little, comfortable, modest home. She did that for more than 80 years. Took in the wash of everybody in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She would charge a nickel for, you know, a shirt, maybe a dime for sheets, maybe a nickel for a little girl's dress, pillowcases, another dime or whatever. And every week, she would make her daily deposits in the bank. She did that for more than 80 years. Everybody laughed at little old Osceola McCarty. And they asked her, girl, what you doing washing those people clothes? You do something, blah, blah, blah. You do you. Well, after nearly 80 years of work, she gets a phone call from her banker. And the banker says, Ms. McCarty, 
As a senior level vice president at this bank, I am obligated to ask you the following question. But before I ask you the question, it's no secret. You are getting up in years, and the question begs asking, what do you want done with your resources and the untimely nature of your death? And there was a pause on the phone. And this vice president at this bank, you know, he could sense that Osceola McCarty didn't even know how much money she had saved in more than 80 years. He said, Ms. McCarty, do you have any idea how much money you've saved? And she said, no, tell me. And he says, more than a quarter of a million dollars. And there's another pause on the phone, and he sensed she didn't even know the value of a quarter of a million dollars. He said, I'll tell you what, Ms. McCarty, end the conversation, end the conversation. Do me a big favor. Come by my office next week, and we can take this conversation a little further. But if you would just think about what you want done with your resources. Following week comes around, Austin McCarty goes to the bank, goes into that banker's office, and that banker says, Ms. McCarty, I got 10 dimes on my desk. When I point to a dime, that's going to symbolize one-tenth of your savings. And you tell me what you want done with the resources. He points to the first dime. And she says, I know exactly what I want you to do. I want you to give that portion to my church. I love my church members, and I love my pastors. He points to the next two dimes. She says, well, I never had children of my own. I've never been married, but I do have two nephews, and I, I, I want them to lead a comfortable life, give them that portion of my resources. And then the banker says, well, what about the other seven dimes? She says, I know exactly what I want you to do with that money. She says, I want you to send that money to the school in town. He said, what school? You mean the University of Southern Mississippi, the school she was barred from attending because of her race? She said, yes, sir. The following week, the bulk of her savings goes over to the development office of the University of Southern Mississippi with a handwritten note by Osceola McCarty that says, please give my money to worthy and deserving African-American students who still possess the ability to dream. Who still possess the ability to dream. When word got around that this washerwoman gave every dime that came by her hand away, people started matching her financial gift. Ted Turner, the founder of TBS and CNN News, he called a press conference to announce if she can give away all that money, I can at least give away a billion. She didn't get a letter. She got a phone call from President Bill Clinton at the time begging her to come up to Washington, D.C. to bestow on her the highest honor he could give to a private citizen. Scared to death of flying, she took the train from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, all the way up to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Never spent a night in a hotel room in her life. When she got to D.C., the first time in her life, she spent a night in a hotel room. Before she checks out the next morning, she made up the bed before she left. The press club. They got a luncheon for her in her honor. Philan you know, a journalist runs up to her and says, Ms. McCarty, how does it feel being a philanthropist? She says, what is that? Well, she goes back to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and they're writing a feature article on their role model. And the journalist says, Ms. McCarty, you have enabled the dreams of so many. Do you have a dream? And she says, yes, I have a dream, but I don't know if the Lord going to let me see it. She says, please, tell us so I can share it with our readers. She says, well... I just hope the Lord let me live long enough where I could see the first, you know, the first student, you know, walk across the stage and get his or her degree with my money. Less than four months later, Osceola McCarty sits in the front row. Commencement, University of Southern Mississippi, and watches little Stephanie Bullock. That picture is in my study. The development office at the University of Southern Mississippi sent me that picture. Stephanie Bullock, Jazz, Danielle, she was a business major. She was an honor student. Comes from a little small town in Mississippi, town so small, doesn't even appear on most state maps. Less than 90 days later, Osceola McCarty makes her transition. The journalist who was writing that article tracks little Stephanie Bullock down and says, you know, your benefactor has died. You know, she's gone on. She's died. Any comment you want to make? Anything you want to share with our readers? And she says, yes, I do have a comment. Please, what is it? She said, heaven couldn't have gained a better angel. Heaven couldn't gain a better angel. Now, what in the world does this have to do with you? 
What was her life about? Her life was about service. Her life was about service. If you never see that formula again, please take good notes. Q plus Q plus MA equals C. The quality of your service plus the quantity of your service plus the mental attitude in which it is rendered always equals compensation. Everybody has a customer. If you're a doctor, your customer is just patient. If you're a parent, your customer is your child. If you're a teacher, moi, <laughs> my customer are my students. And we all got the same task, deliver better service, faster service, be more productive and more efficient. Be more productive and more efficient. A happy customer tells five of his friends. A dissatisfied customer tells 15 of his friends. Look, damn it, if you are met with a customer complaint, the worst thing in the world you can do is let that customer walk out that door. Why? It takes 19 times the money, the capital, the effort, the resources to win a customer's favor in the future as it is to keep an existing customer. And under no circumstances, no circumstances, let the nice customer ruin your business. Dr. Kimber, what in the world are you talking about? See, the nice customer will sit at the table, wait for his order to be taken while the waiter is on the phone talking to his buddies. The nice customer will sit at the table and drink the red wine when she specifically asked for white. The nice customer will sit there and eat the well-done steak when she requested rare. Nice customer will do that, but the nice customer never comes back. The nice customer never comes back. Listen to me, entrepreneurs. Listen to me, sales executives. Don't come up to me when you get the order. No, you come up to me when you get the reorder. And if you don't get the order, I need to know why you didn't get the order. Service. See, and that's going back to Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell. Go get Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. Go get that book, all 330 pages, take it into that chemistry class, and assay it down to its finest components. And what are the finest components? To the tipping point. Again, people don't care about you until they realize how much you care about them. Well, thank you very much for this little feeble talk. Uh, if you're ever on campus, please come visit me, 318 Wright Hall. And, uh, you know, uh, I try to be on campus all the time. And uh, you are more than welcome to come into my office. If I'm not in my office and you come in the office and walk in and walk out before you leave my office, make sure you cut the lights off. We think green. <laughs> and when you cut the lights off, what's the last image your eyeballs are going to see? You come to my office and you look by that light switch in my office. And the last image that these 67-year-old eyeballs see is a picture of my icon. And I have no, no problem telling people, I want to be just like the boys. You ask Cornell West, go to Princeton. Cornell West will tell you, Cornell, who's your icon? Man, Doc, I want to be just like the boys. Go to Georgetown. Sit down with Michael Eric Dyson, Eric Michael Dyson. He will tell you, man, I want to be just like the boys. Go up to Harvard, talk to Henry Gates. Henry, who do you want to be like? Man, Doc got to be like the boys. Well, I'm not any different. I get a chance every day to walk the bricks that this icon walked. My office, the office that he had was in Harkness Hall, in the basement of Harkness Hall. So come in, cut the lights out. The last image you see is a picture of the icon himself, black America's most prolific scholar. But equally important, under that picture, my light switch are the following words. DK. Before you stand before your students today, don't you forget, a poor teacher complains. A good teacher explains. An excellent teacher demonstrates. But a great teacher, well, damn it, a great teacher inspires. And what in the world is inspired? It's in spirit. It's in spirit. When Du Bois was there at Atlanta University, you know, he taught civics. The man taught Greek. For three years, three of the 12 years that he was there, he was university chaplain. He taught economics. And sometimes students will walk into his economics class thinking they're going to discuss supply and demand, net present value, elasticity. The boys wouldn't do any of that. 
pull out his Bible and he reads scripture. So as I close this bad boy out, just want to be like the boys. I don't know if Danielle and I don't know if Jasmine Eke remembered, but I know that the first paper that I placed in the hand before I gave him the syllabus were the four greatest prayers. And what are the four greatest prayers? Number one, the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the meek, for they, you know, blessed are the righteousness. Blessed are those who have peace of mind. And boys and girls, what in the world is peace of mind? Doesn't mean that me and Clifton exchange words and we box and now we hug and kiss and made up. Doesn't mean that. Peace of mind is in the absence of all negative emotions, fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, guilt, greed. What is the second prayer? Lord's Prayer, our Father, our Father. Didn't say the black father, white father, Hispanic father, Asian father. That means you aren't your brother's keeper, you're your brother's brother. Look, damn it, I don't have to be a Christian to go ahead and be inspired by the holiest day on the Christian calendar, which is Easter Sunday. I don't have to be Muslim to be inspired by the holiest day on the Muslim calendar, which is Ramadan. I don't have to be Jewish to be spiritually uplifted by the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, which is Yom Kippur. We all came from someplace in the same source, and we are all one. What is number three? Number three is Mother Teresa. People may tear down in a day what took you years to build. Build anyway. People may call you foolish. People may scoff and they may laugh at, you know, you know, build anyway, love anyway, because the final analysis is never between you and them. It's only between you and God. It's only between you and God. I didn't choose to be here and you didn't choose to be here. The bottom line is you were chosen. You were chosen. So you got to ask yourself the question, if I didn't show up at this particular time and place, what would the world miss? Me? If I didn't show up, world going to miss a lot. One book alone, one book alone, there's going to be at least one million people, one book alone, that are going to miss Napoleon Hill and what he had to offer because the baton was passed to me and I ran with it. You're going to miss a lot. And then last but not least, you got, a, you got one of your major towns named after this individual, St. Francis of Assisi, San Francisco. And what did he say? Where there's injury, let me sow pardon. And where there's doubt, let me sow faith. What are the three toughest things in the world to do? Number one, you know, speak for the absent. Just whoever, whoever's absent, there's two sides to every story. Just like Peter said, I got three, I mean, the, the Lord blessed me. When I got married, I said, I asked, my, I asked the Lord for a child. He gave me the three best. And when they get together over the holidays, they just start changing notes, you know, trading notes, talking to the sister, and just running them up. Well, she said this, and she said that, and she said that. <laughs> I'm not eavesdropping, but I go to the kitchen table for breakfast, man, and I said, well, who are you guys talking about? Uh, well, let me defend the absent. Well, no one needs to know to defend her. And she said, oh, okay. <laughs> Number one, defend the absent. Defend the absent. There's two sides to everything. Number two, you know, what did he say? Where there's injury, you know, deliver love for hate. Deliver love for hate. What did Martin Luther King said? Martin Luther King said one of the highest forms of love is between a parent and a child. And then he said, but there's a higher form than love than that. It's between a parent and a child that lives on the other side of town. But then Dr. King says, the ultimate highest form of love is between a parent and a child clear across the world. Oh my goodness. See, Dr. King was talking about two different forms of love. And what are they? There's filial love. What is filial love? Ladies, you hear that from the brothers all the time. Kind of, sort of, when you want to, when it's inconvenient. <laughs> oh, we hear that all the time, don't you, ladies? Oh, girl, I still love you in the morning. You know that, you know, you're kind of, sort of love, you know. That's filial love. But according to Dr. King, there's another type of love. What is that? Well, that's agape love. And what is agape love? Agape love is unconditional. And agape love is in spite of. And what, and what, what, what do I want to share with you, ladies? You know, I probably got more young ladies in my class. My class is 80% female. And I tell them. 
The reason why I love you because you're the only species on earth that asks the most important question. And ladies, what is the most important question? Most important question in the universe is, what about the children? What, what, yeah, I, I hear you, but, but what about the children? Yeah, 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 yeah. What about the children? And you saw, we have seen agape love. We see it all the time. You come to Atlanta, go to Fulton County, you got what, 20, 30, 40 firehouses. You ask any firefighter in Fulton County that when the house is on fire and the father gets there and he knows his children in the house, and he's ready to walk into that house, and the firefighter puts out his arms and says, Sir, it's too dangerous. You can't go in there. What does the father say? But my children are in there. Sir, it's too dangerous. You can't go in there. The father takes a look and walks off. But you let the mother get there. <laughs> Ask any firefighter. Ma'am, it's too dangerous. But my children are in there. Ma'am, it's too dangerous. What does she do? She removes his hand and walks in. You saw that with Kevin Durant when he got the MVP a couple years ago. What did the man say? Everybody was there to see him receive the award. And he said, you're honoring the, war the, the wrong individual. He said, I'm not the MVP. She's the MVP pointing to his mother. See, me and my brother ate when she didn't. Me and my brother, we slept at night when she came home to check on us and she went to a second job. Don't give this award to me. Give it to her. She's the real MVP. That's agape love. And damn it, you saw it with your former president, the last speech he gave. Wasn't a dry eye in the house. He called his wife out by name. She got the full name, Michelle LaVon Robinson. And he said, oh my God. <laughs> he said, you didn't ask for this, but you took it on and you made it your own. That's agape love. So number one, defend the absent. Number two, return love for hate. And number three, what you have done today as I finally sit down, will you please make a difference? Will you? When are you going to place your fingerprints on life and prove you were here? Somebody said it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say till he tried. So he buckled right in with the trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. Somebody scoffed, you'll never do that, at least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat and the first thing we know he begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin without any doubting or quitted. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. There are thousands to tell you cannot be done. There are thousands of prophecy failure. There are thousands ready to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait till assail you. But with a lift of your chin and a bit of your grin, you just take off your coat and go to it. You started to sing as you tackled the thing. You heard me say it before. Spit in his face, he becomes Marcus Garvey. Slam the school door in her face, she becomes Mary McLeod Bethune. Write him off as another fatherless black male. Becomes Ben Carson, make him shine your shoes, I'll show you James Brown. Disobey his orders, he becomes Colin Powell. Blind him, becomes Stevie Wonder. Raper, she becomes Maya Angelou. Put him in a prison cell, throw away the key. You got two choices. You got Nelson Mandela, you got Malcolm X. Deny her adequate startup capital. I'll show you Oprah Winfrey. And tell that individual, man, we're gonna have an empowerment series, man. You need to be here, come here. Man, there's gonna be speakers all across the country to go ahead, not only inspire you, not only lift you up, but to show you, damn it, how to connect these dots because your creator did not create scarcity, lack, poverty, inconvenience, and there'll be any individual in here. Aren't my students great? Don't you love Danielle and, and Jazz? <laughs> Adios.